really see you because the lights are really bright, but I trust you can all see me. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Meisner, and I'd like to welcome you to the 18th annual John D. Spellman Awards for Achievement in Historic Preservation. Every year, we really look forward to recognizing exceptional work being done around the county to preserve our heritage and revitalize our communities. And the award program also gives us a reason to visit one of King County's many wonderful cities. Um, you're going to see in a moment that there's a ton of great preservation work happening in the south part of the county. So it's especially fitting that we are celebrating here in Auburn this morning. We're also very excited to be holding this year's awards at the Auburn Masonic Temple, which has been home to the King Solomon Lodge number 60 since 1924. You'll hear a lot more about the Lodge's commitment to preserving their historic building a little bit later in the program, um, but I do want to thank the members of the Lodge for being such caring stewards of this incredible building and for graciously hosting us today. So thank you to all the Lodge members. I know a lot of you are here. Um, these awards are named for John D. Spellman, who served as the first King County Executive from 1969 to 1980, after which he was elected Governor of Washington State, a position he held from 1981 to 1985. During his term as King County Executive, Governor Spellman laid the foundation for preservation in King County as we know it today. He was instrumental in passing the King County Landmarks Ordinance and establishing the Landmarks Commission, and he developed the first comprehensive plan policies related to historic preservation. Governor Spellman passed away this last January, and his passing makes it all the more important that we continue to honor his legacy by preserving the places that tell the full stories of our past. At this time, I know it's dark in here, but I'd like to invite all uh, current and former Landmarks Commissioners and Special Commissioners to stand and be recognized. Oh, thanks for the lights. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your service and dedication. You do amazing work for all of us, and we really appreciate it. And to this year's award winners and their project partners, thank you for your hard work and perseverance and for coming out to celebrate and be recognized today. I'd also like to acknowledge For Culture, King County's Cultural Services Agency, with whom we are proud to partner and whose funding and expertise contributes to countless preservation projects every year. We're joined today by several members of For Culture staff, including their brand new executive director, Brian Carter. Um, Brian is definitely a friend to preservation and heritage, and we're just uh, thrilled um, that he is at the helm of For Culture now. Um, and finally, and we don't have a slide for this one because Todd put together the PowerPoint. And I'm sure even if I'd asked him, he wouldn't have put a picture of himself up there. Um, I just want to acknowledge Todd Scott, who has done an incredible job as our Landmarks Coordinator and Preservation Architect for the last 11 years. Um, don't worry, Todd isn't going anywhere. He's just decided to shift positions in our office. Um, which leads me to introduce our brand new Landmarks Coordinator, Sarah Steen. Uh, Sarah is here today, and she will uh, officially join our small but mighty team on Monday. Um, so we're really happy to, to welcome Sarah and to thank Todd for his fantastic work over the years. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, where am I? Oh. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Nancy Backus, who is the mayor of the city of Auburn, and she'd like to come up and say a few words of welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Jennifer. You know, I can't think of a better place for us to be today to celebrate the award winners than here at the Masonic Temple. It's a place that not only highlights the beauty of Auburn's history, but which also showcases the way in which landmarks preserve the story of a community. Now, when we were in the other room in the reception area, I was talking with a few people and I said, you know, I would imagine just about everybody in the city of Auburn and many who visit here know the Masonic Temple. 
they drive by, they know exactly where it is. It's a landmark that you tell people how to get to someplace from the Masonic Temple. But I would imagine over 90% of the people who know this building have never been inside this building. And that's, that's a shame because it is truly a beautiful building. And projects such as the restoration that were completed here creates a renewed sense of pride. They're a symbol that what was worth investing in before is most definitely worth investing in again for our future. They connect us with past generations through a love of place while also providing the lens of time for us to examine just how far we have come. Preserving our historic places in a, is about more than just honoring the past. It's also about strengthening our sense of community today. Celebrations such as this remind us that we are creating a legacy of our own that with any luck, future generations will look back on with pride as well. Congratulations to today's award winners and thank you for the work you have done to protect our history. And I am so honored that we are celebrating today in a city that I love, in a city that I am proud to represent. And I am so thankful for all of you and the work that you do as dedicated to preserving such important history. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. And now I'd like to introduce Poppy Handy, who is King County Landmarks Commission Chair. Poppy's gonna come up and present certificates of designation to owners of recently landmarked properties. Poppy. <coughs> You were right, it is bright behind here. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me up here. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of my uh, volunteer job, is to get up here and um, really um, say thank you to all the folks that have designated their properties over the last year. We know it's a big commitment. Uh, the first one we have is the F.W. Woolworth Company Store. <laughs> Um, the former F.W. Woolworth Company store is Renton's first lo locally designated landmark. Woolworth established its store in the heart of Renton's commercial district during the city's economic boom, which was brought about when the Boeing Company opened its nearby aircraft manufacturing plant in 1941. Built in the sleek and geometric international style, Woolworth operated its five-and-dime store here from 1954 until 1973. This building is significantly associated with the development of downtown Renton and representative of downtowns across rural America before retail activity shifted to suburban shopping centers. Woolworths, now called the Cortona Building, has been returned to its former stature as a retail anchor and is a great example of how historic preservation can revitalize downtowns. Owners Dave and Monica Bretauer <laughs> who completed the stunning restoration are not able to be here today and we'll be mailing them their certificate. <clears throat> the next one uh, we have is the Gilman Town Hall and Jail. As the second <laughs> oldest building in the vicinity of Issaquah's downtown, the Gilman Town Hall has witnessed the community's transformation from the mining settlement of Gilman to the vibrant town of Issaquah. Gilman Town Hall was built by town founder Inga Wold built between, uh, uh, who was the founder between 1888 and 1892. It served as the first civic meeting house and has been home to a variety of uses during its 130 year history, including the town hall from 1898 to 1930, a private residence from 1930 to 1972, and a city owned local history museum from 1973 until the present. <clears throat> A two-cell concrete gel was erected behind the hall in 1914. We commend the city of Issaquah for protecting and stewarding this important physical reminder of the city's earliest beginnings. What, is Erica Manayas here? We weren't sure if she was gonna be here this morning or not. She's not, okay, so we'll also be mailing her her certificate. <clears throat> Our next um, designation is the Boeing Airplane Company's <laughs> Building 105. The Boeing Airplane Company's Building 105, commonly known as the Red Barn, was built as a boat shed on the banks of the Duwamish River in 1909 by Pacific Northwest Shipwright 
Edward W. Heath. Heath fell into financial difficulty while constructing a custom motor yacht for lumber baron William E. Boeing in 1910, so Boeing acquired the shipyard to keep his project on track. In 1916, the Red Barn became the nucleus of Boeing Airplane Company's first factory, later called Plant One. Most intensely used from 1916 to 1936, the Red Barn embodies the first astounding 20 years of the Boeing Airplane Company's history. In the mid-1960s, Boeing employees and preservation enthusiasts learned that the Red Barn was threatened by plans to update Plant One, so they mobilized to save it. In late 1975, the Red Barn was barged up the Duwamish River to the edge of Boeing Field and five years later moved, its pre moved to its present, lo present location on the mu Museum of Flight Campus. <clears throat> Fully rehabilitated, the Red Barn now serves as a focal point of this reg regional aviation museum. I'd like to invite Jeff Bauknet, is that correct? Sorry if I mispronounced that, with the Museum of Flight to come up and accept a certificate of landmark designation for the Red Barn. <clears throat> Um, our next certificate is for the Buchanan House. Uh, the Dr. William D. Buchanan House is one of eight homes built by the Kirkland Land and Improvement Company in 1889, shortly after British steel tycoon Peter Kirk arrived and established the area. Dr. Buchanan was Kirkland's first physician, and this house served as both the residence for him and his wife, Abby, and as Dr. Buchanan's office. The two-story wood frame Buchanan House is an exam excellent example of the late 19th century folk Victorian style and one of only a few outstanding residential buildings associated with Kirkland's founding. <coughs> when this house was slated for demolition, the city of Kirkland worked with four culture and preservation advocates to save it. In 2016, the house was moved to a nearby parking lot to await a party willing to acquire the house and in 2017, Kim and Dan Hartman saved the day by purchasing and moving it to a new permanent lot just a few blocks from its original location. Tremendous thanks go out to the Hartmans for saving this historically and architecturally significant house and giving it a new life. Will Kim and Dan Hartman please come up and receive your certificate of designation? Um, the Puget Sound Electric Railway Interurban Car 523 was constructed in 1907 by the St. Louis Car Company in St. Louis, Missouri. It is one of only 37 wood interurban cars from this era known to survive worldwide. Car 523 was purchased by Puget Sound Electric Railway in 1907 and shipped to the railway's workshop in Kent. It served the Puget Sound Electric Rail Railway between Seattle and Tacoma for 20 of the railway's 26 years until 1928 when service stopped. During this period, Car 523 carried many passengers to and from the 1909 Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition and many troops during and immediately after World War I. It is the only known surviving car or locomotive of the railway. <clears throat> Northwest Railway Museum saved it and will embark on a complete restoration of this rare object associated with the development of King County as soon as grant funds are available. Will Richard Anderson, the museum's executive director, please come up and receive your certificate of designation. And our um, final certificate is to St. Edward Seminary. The monumental St. Edward, Edward Seminary building has stood as a focal point in St. Edward State Park in Kenmore since 1931. The 82,000 square foot brick and concrete building was designed by notable architect John Graham Sr. It is an outstanding example of the late Romanesque revival style and one of few buildings in King County that display this imposing style and scale. 
Establishment of St. Edward Seminary was a seminal achievement in the life of Bishop Edward John O'Day. The building served as the Northwest's preparatory school for the Catholic priesthood for 45 years and was the first accredited full seminary university in the United States. The seminary closed in 1976. In 1977, the property was sold to the state of Washington and became St. Edward State Park. After sitting largely vacant and deteriorating for 40 years, in 2017, state parks entered into public-private partnership with Daniels Real Estate. Daniels is undertaking a complete building rehabilitation project and re will reopen it to the public as a guest lodge, conference facility, and spa. Will Trevina Wang with Daniels Real Estate please come up and accept the certificate of designation? On behalf of King County Landmarks Commission and staff, I would like to thank you and the many other landmark property owners who are caretakers of our history. It is because of you and your remarkable dedication to preservation that we are here today. Thank you. Thank you, Poppy. And now it's my pleasure, as always, to introduce King County Executive Dow Constantine. Dow cares deeply about protect, protecting the places that connect us to our past, that allow us to gather and share meaningful and sometimes just plain fun cultural experiences, and that enrich our lives every single day. Thank goodness we can always count on Dow's leadership and support when places that matter in our communities are threatened. We know he will never shy away from a preservation challenge. Dow, thank you for making time to celebrate preservation success stories with us every year. Now please come up and present the awards. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I'm, uh, I am a, a preservation advocate. Uh, you know, in my job, we have these big pressing issues that we have to deal with all the time. This afternoon, I'm going to spend uh, a whole bunch more time on the, the crisis of homelessness, and we deal with the criminal justice system and how can we rescue our youth from uh, going down the wrong path, and we deal with global climate change and the decline of the salmon and all these massive issues, and yet there are some issues um, that I'm, I am also particularly passionate about, uh, the, the passions that are brought to this job, including uh, uh, the humane treatment of animals, and we've remade our entire animal welfare system in King County and have become a model for the country. And another of those uh, that well predates my time in elected office, in fact, is my passion for historic preservation. And I'm so lucky to have had a predecessor like John Spellman, uh, who cared just as deeply about landmarks and preservation in our history. And we lost John this year, uh, this last year. He. Uh, was, as I called him at the time, the George Washington of modern King County. And, uh, and in fact, uh, we are uh, honoring him by renaming not just a building, but an, a block of downtown Seattle in his honor. Uh, so whatever uh, over the next centuries happens on that block, it will always be the John Spellman block and building. Uh, and I am also tremendously fortunate, considering this particular interest of mine, to have the absolute uh, best uh, guru of preservation uh, at my side at all times, Jennifer Meisner. Uh, she's just uh, constantly receiving messages, texts, et cetera, from me asking about particular buildings and details of buildings and what can we do to save this and that and wouldn't it make sense for us to put money into this other. And um, I feel very, very, very lucky that even though we don't, we don't have a massive uh, uh, staff to, to pursue this work, we have somebody who is absolutely the best in the business and uh, allows me to attend to these other minor issues I described before while having absolute confidence that we have our eye on the ball of preservation. So thank you, Jennifer. 
so on with the awards. Uh, there are, I believe, five awards and uh, a lot to say about each of them, but I have to tell you that as I read through this, I was so tremendously impressed by the work that people are doing every single day across this vast county of uh, far more than two million people now. So, the first. For the past 28 years, Patricia Cosgrove has been an unstoppable force for heritage, preservation, and the arts in South King County. Patricia came to the White River Valley Museum as its first paid staff member in November of 1990. She was also, she's also served as a volunteer teacher in professional development courses for regional nonprofits and served on the boards of Auburn Rotary and our own for culture. Patricia was instrumental in establishing the partnership between the White River Valley Historical Society and the city of Auburn, which is now a model for other nonprofit museums. She has served as director under four Auburn mayors, uh, mounting roughly 60 exhibits and overseeing dramatic growth in the museum's budget, its staff, and its volunteer program. In the mid-1990s, Patricia spearheaded museum renovations, raising $2 million through grants and individual donations. She then trained her sights on the historic Mary Olson Farm overseeing the city acquisition, master planning process, landmark designation, and multi-phased restoration project covering the historic buildings, orchard gardens, for which she raised more than $2.4 million. To quote former White River Valley Museum president, Mike Weibel, from a patch of blackberries in a forgotten corner of Auburn, Patricia Cosgrove recognized the potential of a rundown family farm, envisioned the possibilities for what it would become, and helped birth the remarkable historic site and facility. The farm, which was honored with Historic Seattle's Best Restoration Project Award, was open to the public in 2011. The museum's field trip program has served more than 23,000 children, and the farm is now visited by some 2,000 students every year. As for adults, uh, there's the annual September Hops and Crops Microbrew Festival at the farm. Uh, a nod to Mary Olson, we know nothing of her taste for beer, but we do know that she raised hops. <laughs> Throughout her career, Patricia's passion for telling the stories of all King County's residents led her to reach out and cultivate ongoing relationships with members of the community. The trust she gained through her kindness and professionalism with members of the White River Valley Buddhist Temple, for example, enabled her to gather historic photographs and documentation to support landmark designation of the Auburn Pioneer Cemetery. This property is significantly associated both with Auburn's earliest white settlers and with traditional Japanese cultural practices of the Japanese American community from the early 20th century and, include, and, and continuing to the present. Later this month, Patricia will retire from her nearly 30-year tenure with the city of Auburn. Her legacy of preserving, stewarding, and interpreting places that tell a community's stories will serve the people of King County for many generations to come. Will Patricia Cosgrove please come up and accept the 2018 John D. Spellman Award for Career Achievement. I wish to thank you all, and uh, this is a lovely honor to get at this point in my life. I'm, uh, I'm trying not to suffer from short timers syndrome right now, <laughs> and this kind of thing is a lovely buoy and focus for me to carry on and try to leave everything in the best uh, setting that I can. Um, I've had the honor of working for the city of Auburn, which has been very supportive of both education and preservation as seen in letting me work in this fashion to uh, partner with school districts, with the temple, with the tribe, with all kinds of groups to bring them together with art and heritage and preservation. And uh, it will be very hard for me to uh, turn over the keys to the farm. I may just make some copies mm -hmm. for myself <laughs> so that I can go visit Pip and Stinger, the donkeys, and Libby the cow, and sit under the orchard and admire it. 
So uh, with that, I thank you very much, and thank you, sir, for all of your work. Auburn Masonic Temple, home of King Solomon Lodge Number 60, has been in this location for nearly a century. Uh, the lodge itself was chartered in 1890 as the second fraternal order in Auburn, following the Knights of Pythias by only a few months. Early community leaders, including C.H. French, Vice President of Farmers and Merchants Bank, C.P. Lacey, liveryman and hotel owner, and Aaron Neely, a Valley pioneer, were all members of this lodge. For the first three decades, the lodge met in various rented halls, and then in 1924, this Italian Renaissance Revival temple was constructed. The Auburn Masonic Temple was designed by the notable Tacoma architectural firm of Heath, Gove, and Bell, which also designed the Masonic home in Des Moines and the Paradise Inn at Mount Rainier. Since the temple's completion, the Lodge Hall has been in continuous use and housed numerous ground floor commercial uses. Among the typical establishments were shops selling, good, selling dry goods, gentlemen's furnishings, and boots and shoes, but the longest tenured tenant was the Taylor Lamar Mortuary, which occupied a portion of the first floor and basement from 1929 to 1956. Another long-term occupant was the National Bank of Commerce from 1950 to 1962. Everybody who had an NB of C account, raise your hand. I know. <laughs> My first checking account. The bank prompted remodeling of many of the storefronts in which the original wood storefronts were replaced with aluminum storefronts and green tiles reflecting the style of the time. The bank expanded across the entire north facade, reducing uh, what had been three separate storefronts and entrances down to one. A few years ago, the lodge began diligently restoring parts of the building, first re repointing the brick on the east and north, or excuse me, on the east and south sides. They began the renovation by addressing the most obvious issue, a deteriorating canopy at the south end of the building. Project manager Chad Lester, who is well-versed in classical architecture, consulted with the county preservation staff and researched the appearance of the original storefronts using historic photos. Contractor Kevin Gent proved the right man for the restoration job. The original architect of the building was a hero of his, and he had worked on several of Heath's buildings. With some adaptations for modern building codes, including safety glass and fiber cement panels on the bulkheads, the first storefront was complete. Three other storefronts have since been completed, and work on the fifth will start soon, with funding provided by the Masons, with some small grant assistance from Four Culture. Once the storefront, is, or once the storefront renovation is complete, they will begin restoration work inside the building. Today, the temple's storefronts appear much as they did when the building opened in 1924. The restoration was, has generated significant interest along Auburn's main street and was encouraged, has encouraged others to consider making improvements to their storefronts. Uh, as a side note, uh, I so appreciate uh, the, uh, the uh, members of King Solomon Lodge uh, inviting us here today and being our hosts. Uh, my grandfather and his father actually uh, were Masons, and my grandfather's member of the Scottish Rite Temple in Everett, which was tragically not preserved, but demolished for the construction of a hockey rink. Yeah. Something of which I remind the city fathers of Everett every time I see them. <laughs> so I'm particularly pleased to award the 2018 John D. Spellman Award for Excellence in Restoration to the King Solomon Masonic Lodge, number 60. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the Auburn Freemasons, we want to thank you uh, for attending today and bestowing this uh, award. Uh, we want to thank Four Culture. Um, it, was, it was the big push to get us started in our restoration work. Um, and we have a long road ahead of us. Uh, we just, anybody wants to come in and look at, at the progress we'll be making over the next years, please feel free. Uh, the doors are open. Um, it's just, it's a good thing to, 
to bring this back to the way it used to be. Uh, so we, we can thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you. Again, thank you for everybody coming out. Um, this is Tom Crawford. He is the chairman of the Temple Board, the Masons that actually own the building. And I am Mike Palquadine. I am the Worshipful Master. I am the leader of the Masons, the actual lodge. And it's a group effort to get this done. Thank you for the award. Thank you. Historic barns are visible reminders of King County's heritage. You can't miss this majestic Gothic arch barn which sits just off Highway 164 south of Auburn. It was built in the mid-1940s by Harry Tupper, the current owner's grandfather, and has been in the family for three generations. Mr. Tupper built the barn as well as the attached loafing shed and milking parlor to support his dairy farm. Tupper's family continued to use the barn for the next 70 years, mainly for hay storage. The loafing shed, with its diagonal feeders, provided shelter for several head of cattle and milking parlor. Still housing original stanchions and watering cups, it was used for hay and grain storage. By 2017, however, the roof was leaking. The siding had gotten bad enough. The rain was coming in through the walls. Fortunately, Stan and Barbara Olajinski the current owners heard the county's barn again heard about the county's barn again historic preservation program. This this was a result when I was on the council of Kathy Lambert and me when I was the budget chair up in the corner talking about what we could do to save our rural heritage. And here it's still it's working. <laughs> Um, Barn Again provided grants to help property owners stabilize and rehabilitate their historic barns and sustain King County's farm economy by extending the life of working farms. Barbara and her sisters, Harry Tupper's granddaughters, were determined to continue the barn, uh, using the barn to shelter their cows and store hay, so the Olajinskis applied and were awarded $26,000 towards stabilization for the barn including a new roof and siding. They contributed significantly more to the project, and by last fall, the project was complete. The barn has a new life today. It's soaring hayloft, I can't wait to look at those pictures you were ooing and aahing at. Um, <laughs> it's soaring hayloft, an ideal nesting spot for several barn owls, can hold 2,000 hay bales. The Olajinskis also support the local community by generously opening their barn for high school functions, including field trips, Halloween parties, and photo shoots. The barn may well have been lost if it were not for the Tupper and Olajinski family's stewardship over the last 70 years. It remains a visual landmark in the Auburn Enumclaw community and is now in great shape to serve a fourth generation of the family. Tupper family, thank you for preserving this important part of our rural heritage and, it's a, and the reminder that farming is in fact alive and thriving in King County. Please come up and accept the 2018 John D. Spellman Award for Stewardship. First, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Landmark Commission and then for uh, Masonic Lodge for hosting here. This is a great event. We really do appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to introduce her. Here's, this is uh, Doreen, which used to be Tupper. She is the daughter of Harry, who built the barn. This is uh, sister-in-law, um, Carmen. Yes, thank you. I know who you are. <laughs> Carmen and my wife, Barbara, who's also a daughter. And uh, they've played in the barn since they were little kids. Um, my mother-in-law, Doreen, she still lives right next to the barn, and she, is, um, she still goes out there and feeds the cows daily, unless she feels sick, and then we have to go over there to do that. <laughs> um, she's especially proud of it, and I know as a city boy, before we moved up there about 10 years ago, um, I, got, I got my uh, comeuppance because I said, a hay mow, what kind of word is that? And she said, oh, that's at, like a hay loft. And I said, there's no such word. This is just a made up farm thing. And then after I looked it up, I said, I apologize. You're correct. It, it really is a word. So she knows a lot about the barn. She knows all the details. And it was really neat seeing, we, we said we had to go out and fix this barn when I saw a picture of, I believe it was her brother 
and her dad who are up there in a picture. We tried to get it dated from about the 40s. And it was just amazing because they were up there with no uh, safety equipment whatsoever. And they're up there about 70 feet in the air on this flimsy ladder uh, standing on the beam. So it's, it's very impressive. Um, Harry did an amazing job building this barn, but after 70 plus years, as you saw, it definitely needed some work. So we really do appreciate um, this grant and it really helped us out. We're still using it for hay storage. The only time I really cursed the uh, Landmark Commission is when we had to bring in about 1,800 bales in the summer, but I quickly got over that. So <laughs> after that kind of work, um, it's, it's a great barn though. So we're hoping to use this for future generations. Um, extremely grateful and thank you for keeping this uh, treasured landmark alive for the family. Thank you. In the words of the Sammamish Heritage Society, Sammamish may be a new city, however, it's an old community. Incorporated less than 20 years ago, its history is evident in the names of so many communities that make up today's Sammamish, including Inglewood, Beaver Lake, Monahan, and Adelaide. The Sammamish Heritage Society formed at about the time the city incorporated with the goal of helping residents and visitors understand the diverse history of Sammamish. Education is one focus of this all-volunteer group, which has encouraged other organizations to incorporate history into their projects, such as the Arts Commission's wrapping of utility vaults with historic photos and maps. The Society also recognizes the importance of financial and other incentives for property owners and developers to furthering its mission. Concerned about the demolition of a prominent camp barn and ongoing dis, uh, destruction of historic resources, local resident and architect Eric Brooks contacted the Sammamish Heritage Society. The society knew it needed to have a better understanding of what was left of the city's historic properties, so four culture grant funding was secured to conduct a historic resources survey. Members took on technical tasks far exceeding those typically performed by volunteers, including mapping properties for field work, completing property assessments, and updating the state's historic resources database. In the meantime, more historic properties were being demolished, including three important farmhouses and one farmstead. Despite efforts to find alternatives, two of these properties, the Eddy House and the Baker House, were demolished. To mitigate for the loss of the Eddy House, the developer was required to donate $50,000 to the city to support future preservation efforts. But small farmhouses were not the only resources the community was losing. Although located on the Sammamish Plateau and not in the city, the National Register eligible Providence Heights College is a part of the Greater Sammamish, or of Greater Sammamish's history. Built in 1961, it is an important collection of mid-century modern buildings set in the middle of a wooded campus. Threatened with demolition for future development, advocates led by the society actively campaigned to save the campus. The society successfully nominated the property to the Issaquah Landmarks Register. Legal action by the owner resulted in a decision that allows for demolition, but the society boldly moved forward with the nomination application, even though the chances of saving the building were very low. What's next for the society? It's working with the city on procedures to guide the treatment of historic buildings in the permitting process and to designate other significant properties as local landmarks. The city has been a partner throughout, providing staff support for the society's projects, including the ongoing rehabilitation of the reared Freed Farmhouse, which the society championed saving and relocating to a city-owned park in 2012. I would like to commend the Sammamish Heritage Society for stepping up in the face of intense development pressure and the loss of so many important historic resources on the Sammamish Plateau. With the Society's board members, please come up and accept the 2018 John D. Spellman Award for Achievement in Advocacy. I see what you mean about yeah. these lights. <laughs> I'm really honored on behalf of SHS and all of the very hardworking volunteers who've done the advocacy and preservation work that we've been able to do so far. 
and we're continuing to work on it. We appreciate the support and the recognition from King County Historic Commission, as well as for Culture, which has helped us with quite a few grants enabling the work on the restoration, for example, of the reared house. But these projects wouldn't happen without the volunteers. And I know we have a few more volunteers sitting in the audience who have worked very hard for SHS, and I'd like them to stand up and be acknowledged. <laughs> we, SHS, owes a great deal in particular to the incredible work of Ella Moore and her family of daughters who were born and raised in Sammamish, unlike some of us. <laughs> Thanks largely to their efforts, S SHS has obtained grants to save the reared house, move it onto land that, the city had been that had been donated to the city for a park, and to fund the work to restore the house. And we're very grateful to the grant-making organizations in the state, including for culture. Once the park is open to the public, which will probably be in about 18 months to two years, we hope you'll all be able to come and visit the reared house in its beautiful setting. SHL also obtained a grant from For Culture for the huge project that was undertaken with the direction of our consultant, Ms. Julie Kohler, to survey all of the pre-1941 properties in the city of Sammamish and to record as much as possible of their heritage. And one of the outcomes of that has been we've provided the city of Sammamish with a list of both the properties that no longer have integrity, but more importantly, the properties that do have integrity so that the city is aware and can work with property owners to preserve as much as possible. But finally, I want to make my very heartfelt thanks to the SHS board members. Without them, there wouldn't be an SHS. Uh, we have Mary Moore, Ella Moore, Walton D. Carroll, Steve Thews, and Eric Brooks. They're the heart and soul of the organization, and it wouldn't be happening without them. So I thank them very much indeed. I can't name the individual volunteers, because I'll probably forget them. But all of you who have worked with us, thank you. We appreciate the help. We are looking forward to our ongoing efforts to make Sammamish a better place to live because of its history. Thank you. And finally, for the past 18 years, the John D. Spellman Awards have recognized owners of historic properties, individuals, and heritage groups for their outstanding efforts on behalf of places that tell the stories of King County's past. But this year, for the first time, we are honoring a longstanding business that contributes to the cultural identity and heritage of a community in the new legacy business category. The Roanoke Inn has been a mainstay in the Mercer Island community for over 100 years and is an absolute no-brainer for this inaugural award. In his post on the My Mercer Island blog, Jason Gordon writes, the Roanoke Inn was established in 1914 when George McGuire noticed that visitors arriving at the Roanoke Dock had nowhere to go. So in an effort to serve them and the community, he built a chicken dinner inn near the ferry dock on 72nd Avenue. Business was initially rough, and McGuire had to give up the inn as a result of debts, whereupon Mr. a Mr. Green took over and operated it as a hotel. According to Gordon, at this point, the Roanoke changed hands again and fell into ill repute. <laughs> like so many historic buildings. <laughs> It's rumored that a no good nick owner ran it as a brothel with gambling under the guise of a general store. <laughs> During Prohibition, the bar flouted the law by serving alcohol in coffee mugs, and when drinking again became legal, the Roanoke became a classic tavern and sold groceries, ice cream, and soda. Since minors were not allowed inside, kids could buy ice cream cones and other sundries through a window by the door. 
1943, Edwin and Laura Reek purchased the Roanoke, adding a full menu in addition to serving beer and wine. Their only son, Hal, married Dorothy. And after his passing in 1993, she upheld the family tradition and has been running it ever since. When I first came here, she says, the customers asked me to please not put in pink curtains and change the character of the Roanoke. <laughs> and I've tried to be faithful to that. There have been very few changes. One reason we were able to keep it going is our staff. They all work hard to make people feel comfortable and to maintain the atmosphere of the place. And they are very protective of the business's heritage, she says. Another historical treasure, Deputy King County Executive Fred Jarrett, maintain, remains a big fan of the historic tavern. He says, when I was on the Mercer Island City Council, the Roanoke was where we wound up after council meetings. We just need to start the ferry up again. <laughs> what is perhaps most surprising about the Roanoke is the dichotomy between the inn's tidy manicured exterior and the warm homey interior, often described as a cross between a clubhouse and a roadhouse. The low-lit bar's walls are a pool table green and covered with countless beer-themed garage sale antiques. To say that the Roanoke is a community institution is a vast understatement. I commend Dorothy Reek for maintaining the look, the feel, the traditions that define this business. And I am personally delighted and delighted on behalf of King County to present the inaugural John D. Spellman Award for Legacy Business to the Roanoke Inn. Will Dorothy Reek please come up and accept our thanks. Thank you everybody and I certainly have enjoyed all those who were before me and I respect the work that volunteers and the public does to help keep beautiful old places going for the memories and just to keep the community in a good variety of places to go. Thank, Thank you. Well, that concludes our 2018 Preservation Awards. Thank you so much, Dow, for making the presentations today. And thank you all again for coming. It really is a pleasure for us to do this every year. As Poppy said, we all really do look forward to it. And we just can't thank you enough for all the good work you're doing. And we look forward to celebrating with you again next year. Thanks. Thank you.